Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing Jenny Ja. She was born in Hong Kong, but raised in Fairbanks, Alaska. And she's the founder and owner of Sipping Streams Tea Company. She's won a bunch of awards. And my goodness, she has some fascinating stuff that she knows about tea. Plus, she's even growing tea plants in a geothermal heat farm in Fairbanks, Alaska crazy. Now, she schooled me on a lot of things tea. And in fact, I even learned something about herbal tea and a name for it. But I'm going to let you guys listen to the podcast to learn what exactly that is. So let's introduce you to Jenny Ja and Sipping Streams Tea Company. Hey, health junkies. I have Jenny Ja on and we're going to be talking about her fabulous company, Sipping Stream Tea. And oh my goodness, we were just chatting a little bit about things in, in the environments that we live in. She's up in Alaska. I'm here in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin, and how there's a lot of extreme environments. And what I was impressed about with Jenny is that she is growing tea geothermically up in Anchorage, or Anchorage up in Fairbanks. And boy, we got to talk about that. But Jenny, welcome to the Health Fix podcast. Thank you so much for having me today. So you are a teacher by nature, and boy, you have a lot of classes that I noticed as well. You, you've got everything from tea basics to advanced stuff. What brought you to wanting to teach in addition to owning a tea shop and selling tea? So my background is actually athletic training. So I was a double major in college in athletic training, which if people don't know what that is, it's not a personal trainer. It's like sports medicine. I used to work in a physical therapy clinic and I was also a double major in physical education teaching. So I was a certified tea specialist. I think during COVID, my teaching certificate just lapsed, but I was renewing it up until COVID. <laughs> and, um, and so my first two careers were one was in the health field. And then after I worked at the physical therapy clinic, I was a high school teacher where I taught math, science, PE, and a semester long tea elective course. Um, so that is actually how I got into the tea business instead of the other way around. <laughs> That's cool though, because it is from what I've heard, you're in, you've been in the tea business for 16 years now, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. I, yeah, that's crazy. I have a 16 year old. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that wild to think about it in terms of like, oh my goodness, you know, I have evolved into this and, and my gosh, your, your business, you have retail, you have a restaurant, like tell it, tell us a little bit of what it would be like if folks stepped in to sipping streams and in in Alaska and, and what you're, you know, just give us the lay of the land up there. Tell us kind of what it's like to have that type of business going on. So Fairbanks, Alaska is very small population and it rotates about every 90 days. That's what we say in, in the advertising <laughs> industry and radio and everything like that, because the people who live here, like me, like there's not that many of us who stay here all the time and who've been here for like, you know, 40 plus years. Um, but there's a lot of rotation because of the university, because it's a land, sea and air grant institute. So there's all sorts of researchers all over the world that come here um, for our, our institute, our university institute. Then there is the military. There's Air Force. There's Army. That's by here. And then there's tourism. So that changes and rotates all the time because of our different seasons of mainly summer and then springish time for the Aurora Borealis. Mm -hmm. And so the people who stay here, who really, really live here, who are locals, we're very welcoming of people. We understand people change all the time. And we're a very tight community, even though there's maybe, and I could be wrong with what the numbers are, but I think it's about 80,000 people in our borough. And our borough is actually pretty big big. I technically don't live in city limits and my tea shop isn't in city limits either, but it looks like it's town. You know how it is in like some places and you're like, oh, I thought that was town, but okay. Um, <laughs> anyways, a lot of people who just see the name Sipping Streams Tea Company go, oh, they're a tea store. But if you actually step into my store, it's not just a tea shop. 
It's also a restaurant where we make hundreds, if not thousands, well, thousands every year of Asian steamed dumplings. We have banh mi Vietnamese pork sandwiches because I am Chinese, but also we have British style, like Victorian tea parties that we have every week that people can make by reservation, or you can come in a la carte and almost like a cafe, except we don't serve coffee. <laughs> so you can order tea sandwiches, scones, croissant sandwiches, salads. It's kind of a mixture of hodgepodge because it's based around tea culture, if that makes sense. So we specialize in tea culture and tea education. And that comes from my background of being an educator. I, I love it. I love it. I also heard in a previous podcast that really tea, it wasn't your jam. You liked coffee. You were all about coffee. A lot of Alaskans are all about coffee, but slowly it sounds like you're, you're working that culture into your environment there. Yeah, it was very shocking because I grew up a coffee drinker. Um, I like the taste of coffee, black coffee. I don't put anything in it really. Um, and um, growing up here in Alaska, most people drink coffee and well, it also is a small population, but when I started my tea company, I'm like, oh man, I need to make sure my business is diverse enough. Like I need to offer food or something else besides just tea. If I'm not going to sell coffee and make myself stand out in the market. And I was shocked to find how many people were so relieved to find a place that didn't smell like coffee. I honestly was a coffee drinker. So like, I don't mind the smell of coffee. I didn't think about it. But so many people, well, not so many people, but there is a small population here that would be like, oh my goodness, I only drink tea. I can't even stand the smell of coffee. And I was like, oh, okay, try to be polite about it. I don't want to say that I'm a coffee drinker, but you know, relating <laughs> to them. And it was actually the local people, even though I started off in this touristy area of town, it was a seasonal shop. I couldn't get tourists to come into my little temporary shop and I noticed it was local people over and over again. And as the season was about to end, the summer was about to end, the local people who came in week after week would say, where are you going to be? Where do I get my tea in the winter time? And I was like, oh, oh, there's like demand for this. Oh, okay. So I just leaned into that. And my parents growing up, they were chefs and they had a restaurant when I was a kid also. And my father helped establish a lot of restaurants here, Asian restaurants here. So of course I incorporated food when I opened my first permanent store. Ah, that's really neat. That's really neat. I, you know, I have found that in small areas, when you're committed to, you know, living there full time and people, you know, it, it's just, you get close, right? And people, when they like something, boy, they will dive all in for it. That's what I've found. Yeah, it's amazing the support of small businesses and local community, especially for small intimate communities. That's what makes them really strong. Oh, for sure. For sure. So an interesting thing, you were mentioning the food, you were mentioning your dad being a chef and your dad actually drinking tea with your grandfather. And you, and you, you mentioned in one of your podcasts about it being kind of a ceremonial type of, of situation that would happen every morning, but you didn't really know what the heck was going on. I'd love for you to, to describe that for us and tell us what the heck they were exactly drinking and do you offer it now? Oh, yeah. So I didn't know until I was starting to learn about tea. So my last year of college, I started drinking tea because it was literally the cheapest thing on the coffee shop menu. Because my drink was 528, 526. That was including the sales tax at the time. And I, <laughs> I was like, oh, man, I got to pay these student loans back. You know, like this isn't actually free money. So <laughs> I was like, OK, what's the cheapest thing on the menu? Oh, tea, because I don't like drinking water. I, I wasn't, I didn't grow up drinking water in my family. That wasn't like a thing. So I was like, oh, okay, I'll drink tea. That's like flavored water. And so people started asking me a bunch of questions about tea, which I had no idea about because I'm not a tea drinker. I'm just like <laughs> literally drinking it because it's budget friendly. So the more that I was discovering um, myself, my history, my cultural background and reflecting on my upbringing, I was like, oh yeah, like, I guess my family is pretty Chinese compared to my friends who keep thinking I'm pretty Chinese. I just don't see myself like that because um, Alaska is mostly Caucasians. And so I'm just, well, and in the early eighties, I was born in 82. It was like very much important to assimilate with everyone else. 
and and also Asian people, they don't like making waves or rocking the boat. They just like to like fit in and just kind of blend in and not have a lot of people like look at them or notice them as much as possible. So people would say, oh, well, you're pretty Asian. You do these Asian things. And I'm like, what? What does that even mean? Like, and I knew people always made fun of me when I was a kid, like kids, like the neighbors would tease me because my parents would speak to me in Cantonese because I'm from Hong Kong. <laughs> and we're like that weird Asian family. Like none of the kids want to come over to our house and eat with us because we eat weird Asian food. Um, like not the kind that you get like in the re- regular, you know, Americanized Chinese restaurant, but like authentic banquet style food. It's like my dad was used to cooking like a five star restaurant, like the places you go like in heavily Asian populated places for like weddings and all that kind of stuff that's what my dad's like cooking like on a normal basis at home (laughs) so we we ate very fancy for Chinese people but then our neighbors who didn't understand that they thought we were strange but my grandma and grandpa did this weird thing this exercise in front of the tv in the living room like the tv wasn't on but it was the living room because it was big enough space turned out to be tai chi didn't know what (laughs) tai chi was until like I was in college I'm like oh yeah my grandma used to do those kind of weird move things. Oh, is that what it's called? <laughs> and then um, and then my grandpa, he would have his little clay cups and like this thing where he moved this other clay thing, turns out to be a teapot, like over all these little cups and pours water in them. I'm like, okay, it's the weird grandpa thing. And that was the Chinese tea ceremony. So later on when I was older and trying to understand what tea was and I'm, going to different Chinese tea rooms or tea houses where they like sample out the teas for you and you taste test them to find what kind of tea you want to buy. I'm like, oh, that's what my grandpa did every morning. Is that what that is? He was making tea? (laughs) Oh, okay. And then one of the tea places I visited in Seattle, they're having me taste test all these different teas. Um, And when they do that, they're doing the tea ceremony, but they change out the tea every single time. Um, you know, after a few steepings of it. And I tasted one. I'm like, this is what my grandfather had. Because I remember stealing little sips of his <laughs> tea because I didn't know what it was. My sister didn't know what it was. And I'm the oldest one. So she's like, you do it. You figure it out. You know, and I didn't know it was called tea because I, I, I mean, when I go to somebody else's like a neighbor's house, they're having iced tea. I, I thought it came in a pitcher, right? Like a big old pitcher in the refrigerator. Like, I don't know what that is. So seeing it completely different in our household and because people didn't directly communicate and say, I'm having tea right now, I'm doing gung fu cha because there's this divide in the culture of, of um, very traditional, like old school Chinese people is that when you're a child, you never ask adults questions. You sit there quietly. You can observe. You can watch. But if you say something, you need to leave. Like, don't bother the adults kind of thing. So a lot of this is just me observing because I'm not supposed to say anything. And they're not telling me anything. So it's kind of strange. But like, oh, I've had tea before. Like, I did drink tea because I stole it out of my grandpa's weird clay thing, which ends up being a teapot. <laughs> and the tea that he loved drinking was... um tea kuan yin oolong and i only knew that because i went to a chinese um tea shop and tried that tea i'm like this is exactly the same thing that i drank when i was a kid (laughs) and they're like oh yeah this is a very popular like high-end tea i was like whoa my grandpa had like really (laughs) nice taste and so that's my favorite tea today it's also one of our um award-winning teas at sipping streams tea company and so my favorite category Probably because my very first experiences of tea was in the oolong category. That is now currently my favorite category of teas. And that's where most of my awards are in because I probably developed that palette at a very young age when I was stealing these sips of I didn't know what it was. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. That is, that's an awesome story. That is an awesome story of how that comes out. Because, you know, we don't know. And, you know, my story is not even glamorous. Mine's more sipping beer from my dad and I didn't no no not as not as magical as tea at all at all so <laughs> tell, tell us this you know about the oolong being kind of your your award-winning teas do you source the oolong from China or are you growing it in your geothermal tea farm so I source that tea from China which is really funny because some of these 
Chinese teas that I've won awards for mm -hmm. are like really, really good. Where okay. I've had, um, okay, so in Alaska, we have the oil and gold industry, right? right. So I've been asked to um, go to business meetings of really affluent Chinese investors that have flown their private jets here and to do like the tea ceremony for them oh, wow. during their talk. So essentially I'm just making tea for them while they're having their business conference. And then I just stand in the room and I make them tea and I serve them tea over and over again. And so I had to pick the most expensive tea. Well, the nicest tea I could think of. And it was like our, our ginseng oolong and our tea kuan yin oolong. And I knew like it was a very popular tea, especially amongst affluent people. So I would source these teas from China and then these business investors would be so impressed they would want to buy it, which I thought was hilarious because the tea already came from China, but they were <laughs> buying it in Alaska. <laughs> oh boy. The novel, I mean, I'll be honest from us, you know, staters down here, you know, in the Southern half of the States, we, we definitely will be like, Ooh, it's, but it's from Alaska. There's, you know, there's something magical if it comes from Alaska. But I do make some green teas here. We don't sell any of them. Actually, this morning, I started off with a cup of tea of some of the hand-rolled green tea I made recently. Um, I had a homeschool group that wanted to have a field trip at the geothermal tea farm. So they helped me pick the tea leaves. And, um, and it's a two-day process to make tea. So with the steps they they couldn't help me and they didn't get to drink the tea afterwards because it was a two-day process because it was only a one day like a one hour field trip for them out there um at the geothermal tea farm but i did start my morning with having a cup of this really nice green tea that took me hours to make because i have to handle every single individual tea leaf so wow. about the geothermal tea farm is there's not enough production of tea leaves that are optimal for making tea out of so like if you imagine like a bush or a tree right like mm -hmm. do you guys have spruce tips there in wisconsin yes. yes so so if you imagine spruce tips it's just the brand new growth that comes out right nobody wants the spruce branch that doesn't have like that much potency. It's not like that fragrant or aromatic. So on a tea plant, it is also a tree. And so you're wanting to pick the newest, youngest, most tender shoots and growth for processing into tea leaves. And that's what you make into tea or into really good tea. You don't want to use all the old stuff, like the like the mother leaves, Um the stuff that's there you know to to stabilize the plant growth um you want to use the new tender shoots and so when you think about spruce trees or spruce tips you know you want just the ends but not like the really stale you know <laughs> parts of the branch the, and so you have to have thing. a lot of leaves to and lots of branches in order to get enough tea leaves to actually roll them in a mass amount so because we don't have mass amounts of tea leaves, I think maybe the most tea leaves I've ever picked was a pound, but you need about seven to 12 pounds of tea leaves to make one pound of dry leaves. We just don't have enough production on our new tea farm that we had for about two years now. Wow. Wow. You know, I don't think a lot of people ever thought about that in terms of how much fresh leaf turns into dry leaf. And then I think a lot of people might be wondering, just like myself, what does hand rolling the the leaves mean? T tell us about that. What what are you doing? <laughs> I, I laugh because um, my my mother. Okay, so if you've ever made dumplings, it doesn't matter if it's like Italian dumplings, Chinese dumplings, right? You were working with the dough, and you got to be kind of patient because then sometimes the dough gets too thin and it tears, and like it drives my mom nuts. And so this batch of tea leaves that we had just harvested with the homeschool kids, um, and actually turned out to be three times as much as that I harvest by myself the week before, which was amazing because the sun's coming back. So the tea plants love sunlight, natural sunlight. So they shoot off all these new leaves. And so I'm like, oh my goodness, mom, can you help me roll these tea leaves? And she's like, how do you do this? Like she's losing her patience <laughs> making them. 
And I'm like, well, you just kind of like gently roll them like a snake, like like you're in kindergarten class and you're rolling them like Play-Doh. And she's like, what? I, I mean, I'm sure her kindergarten was like way different because she grew up in Hong Kong. <laughs> but, um, but so the very top picking will be two leaves and a bud and they're very tiny and tender and like they can just like disintegrate if you mush them too hard so you're gently like rolling well I this is the recent technique that I've been trying that has been working out really well for me is I roll them like um along this like the length of the leaf so if the leaf is pointing up I would want to roll them in the direction like left or right so the leaves keep staying up if that okay. makes sense. Like I'm twisting the bundle. Yes. Yes. Gotcha. And so, but I have to take my like finger, my one finger or two fingers, and then slowly get it to spin, slowly get it to spin. And then when it starts to like, I increase the pressure of my hand a little bit more because when you press tea leaves or if you press uh, grass, grass blades, right? The mm -hmm. juice starts to come out, right? Mm -hmm. So the juice or the sap, is starting to come out and so it creates a stickiness on the leaf so i don't want to press too hard right away because it just mushes the tiny baby tea leaf and disintegrates it into like a million tiny little pieces that isn't going to stick together i want to gently roll it and spin it and spin it like i'm tightening it like mm -hmm. over and over again and squeezing the tiny micro juices out of the leaves to get it to stick closer and closer and tighter together and so when you think about the tightness of the tea leaf, it's a way of preserving the nutrients, the essential oils, the aroma, because thousands of years ago, there was no such thing as vacuum sealing. That's true. So when, so when you're spinning or rolling or however you're rolling these tea leaves, there's many different ways to shape tea leaves. This is just the way that I figured it out for these really tiny leaves and the small batch that I make at a time. Like I said, it's not enough for me to actually do it the traditional way that's in a, almost like a cheesecloth. And then I roll it and it sticks it to itself. I don't have enough of like a bundle to do that. So I literally have to do this one by one with each individual tea leaf, spinning them to get them to squish tight. And then I put them in the dehydrator and I dry them. So that way, if... um. If they have any moisture in them at all with those juices, it could mold, right? Yeah. So I need to make sure that dries all the way thoroughly. And then when I put it in my plastic Ziploc bag or whatever, um, I can get more of the air out of it. But air will oxidize and over time, that tea leaf will get stale, right? It will lose aromas, essential mm -hmm. oils. It's just not potent, Mm -hmm. And it's like nutritional properties. It's kind of like a dry herb, right? If you've got a lot of space, like you've dried a bunch of oregano or something like that. That's why a lot of people like to crush them to like get the, the air out of it. So it doesn't oxidize and get stale over time. So hand rolling tea leaves, the tighter it is, the, the better everything stays within that leaf, even in the container, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it gives a whole new appreciation to to quality tea. And and for people who are out there, you know, who are looking for tea, I'm guessing the more expensive you teas you have, the more hand, you know, hands on quality processing is going into that particular tea. Exactly, exactly. So usually, so it really depends, you know, who your source is, and like knowing where tea comes from. And like, you could, I mean, you could charge us like an outrageous price for tea, I guess, if someone wants to buy it. So there's a thing about understanding the quality of the tea so you can make your own educated purchase that mm -hmm. you're not getting like ripped off. Because sometimes teas, at least in the high-end tea category, is that you can pay a lot of money for tea that doesn't turn out to be that great. So you do want to be careful. And that's like in the hundreds, like for poor cakes or thousands of dollars you could for poor cakes. But like for this green tea, even green tea, white tea, black tea, you can usually tell by smelling the dry leaves, by seeing how tightly rolled it is. Um, and, and then in the end, like buying a cup of it or whatever, trying it and seeing if it really is 
what it tastes like it is. Like you want it to have potency of its flavor because if you put it in boiling water, for example, and you leave it in boiling water for five minutes, it's pretty much going to extract everything that it possibly can for the most part. So mm-hmm. it should taste super, super strong. If it tastes weak, then that tea is probably stale or is a low quality tea. Wow. Wow. That's valuable information for a lot of people right now. I think just in any realm of tea. Now I have a question for you. I once was told in my schooling, um, and I'm guessing your, your, your plants that you have in the geothermal farm, tea farm are Camilla, Camilla sinensis. I can never yes. say that word right. <laughs> I'm gonna let you say it for me. Um, Camellia sinensis. There you go. Perfect. Because yeah, I always mess that one up. Now, that being the standard kind of basic tea. Now, a lot of people have argued with me over the years about the difference between white tea, green tea, and black tea. I would love for you to explain to folks the difference between those three teas and how they relate back to the same tea plant. Yeah. So the camellia sinensis, or this is the camellia family, right? So not yeah. all camellia plants, trees, are the tea plant of the camellia sinensis. So that's one thing that was recently asked by one of the kids at the field trip, right? And they said their grandparents had camellia trees. Can they make tea out of it? And I said, well, you can make a steeping and an infusion out of its leaves if they're not poisonous or toxic, which I didn't know which one they're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not necessarily the camellia sinensis that makes white tea, green tea, mm-hmm. oolong tea, black tea, and poor tea, or yellow tea and purple tea, those variations. Um, don't want to get too like off the trail with those other ones. But the tea, when we talk about traditional definition of tea, it's from the camellia sinensis plant, and it's hundreds, if not thousands, of varietals. So I have about six different varietals in the tea farm because it's new, it's experimental. We're trying to find out like which varietals do better. So um, so we we start off with like 10 varietals and some of them died off and we're like, okay, not those varietals. We're buying more of the Chinese varietal, um, the super Sochi varietal, which is like a Russian varietal. And then we're trying this new, new one that I can't even pronounce like tetraploid or something like that. I'm actually not sure where that one's from, but the okay so if you imagine an apple right you got an apple from the grocery store it looks pretty good you don't think it's bruised it's like going to be a really nice juicy apple and you just leave that apple on your counter for forever right and if you could not have it mold okay for some reason but it like just dried out somehow mm-hmm. or maybe a better example would be an orange cuz that does better in drying out and not getting moldy. <laughs> um, Fair enough. But it gets kind of pruny and then dried out, right? Mm-hmm. And so then that would be white tea, just like picked off the tree and then dried. A green tea would be like the the apple. You take it home, you kind of roll it on your counter with your hand, like in a circle. So you're bruising it, but you're not breaking the skin, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. You're bruising it, and then you come back tomorrow, and you cut the apple, and it's all brown, like on the outside of it. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe not all the way inside, but you know, near the the skin of the apple, it's kind of brownish. Well, it oxidized, and then an oolong would be that apple that you like rolled around, and then you bashed it on the ground, and a few. <laughs> few hours later, you came back and you bashed it on the ground again without somehow not breaking its skin, really. But that bruising goes deeper and deeper and deeper inside this apple. So when you slice the apple the next day, you see this color variation. More oxidation happened near the skin of the apple. Um, More towards the center, it's a little brown, but not that brown. All the way on the inside of the apple, it's not brown at all because it didn't get bruised all the way in there. Uh, oxygen didn't react all the way into the center of the apple. So that's an oolong tea. And then a black tea is just like bruised, <laughs> torn, like totally, like more like a brown, brown banana. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but 
essentially that's how I relate it because I can see that I'm a very visual person um like if you saw me right now you would see me like moving my arms and you know <laughs> and I'm throwing this fruit on the ground or something like that and um and then a black tea is just like really really oxidized like really bruised really withered um until it almost looks like it's black um, but you don't want it to mold, right? You don't want it to mold. So that's why you dry it. So each of these teas, white tea, green tea, oolong, black, um, well, I'm going to stop at black. Those yes. <laughs> get bruised to, to a certain point, you know, turned brownish, oxidizes to a certain point. Now, I don't want to get into all the hundreds of ways that variations of each of those mm -hmm. categories, but then they dry them and it stops that the main oxidation right mm -hmm. like storage oxidation is a different issue of mm -hmm. it getting more stale and losing its aroma and essential oils but the process of the tea the main oxidation that's reacting with the enzymes of the leaves it's mostly stopped and then poor tea is kind of like turned into a black tea but then kind of like left out to compost a little bit and then they kind of dry it and then there's sometimes an extra step and they kind of like mist some water on it to kind of get it to grow microbes on it and then they kind of dry it again and then they age it so that's why poor tea would be on the only true quote-unquote fermented tea that doesn't go into the kombucha category like liquid kombucha um but that is like a tea tea that's dried so yeah huh yeah i never knew that about the poor tea i i thought I just thought it was just another type of tea. So you're you're schooling me on some stuff here. I love it. I love it. Now you have some teas that you collect. Does it is it you're collecting and foraging in the Anchorage area for some of your ingredients? Is that what I read? Oh yeah. So yeah. So I'm in Fairbanks, and that's like 400 miles of north of Anchorage. I'm sorry, so I'm not yeah. offended, but the like it's very far Different. away. Anchorage. Yes. yes. <laughs> I'm, um, I don't know why I keep saying Anchorage. I think it's because my, I'm originally out of Tacoma before I came out here to Wisconsin. And for some reason, I, I just, my loop brain is on Anchorage. I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. It's the biggest city. Like, you know, we, we, we Alaskans call them the Unalaska because it's like the big <laughs> city. <laughs> and where I'm at, we're a hundred miles south of the Arctic Circle. So we're like, the last big city before you're like really in the middle of nowhere and our town's not that big but um anyway so we wild forge um fireweed um low bush cranberries blueberries um and then we also have a lot of peony farmers here so those who don't spray and have to deadhead their peony flowers that aren't going to be good enough to sell at like floral shops and boutiques and special events they're going to deadhead them and then we get the flower petals cool from them. um and so those wouldn't technically be considered tea because they're not from the camellia sinensis plant they're called tassons which tasson is a french word for herbal infusion so your chamomiles your peppermints your hibiscus your rose hips and all those other things that we forge those wouldn't be technically tea because they're not the same plant they have different benefits this is this is a good distinction because i know that i just said tea i will often say herbal tea but most of the teas i make within my practice to you know for patients or whatnot are not even anything with the camilla sinensis it's none of it it's all mm -hmm. to saints then okay interesting i'm learning stuff here all right keep going sorry Tell so us more. Yeah. And, and oh, we use spruce tips too. So those things are different ingredients we use in our company. Mm. And surprisingly, they're not all for tea. So <laughs> the spruce tips, because of the way that we have to dry them and because the period is so short, but they're really hard to dry, we actually end up freezing the spruce tips and then we high pressure extract them when we're ready to use them. So we almost like juice the spruce tips, which is kind of funny because like if you ever <laughs> picked a spruce needle, you're like, how are you going to juice a spruce needle? <laughs> but um, um, we use it actually as um, one of our flavors for our kombucha that we make. So kombucha is made from tea 
but then we use the spruce tips as an added like juice like flavoring um for the kombucha oh, and wow. then our alaskan blueberries i tried for like over five years to try to make an alaskan blueberry tea did not work mm -hmm. because our technically our alaskan blueberries are not blueberries they're bilberries uh -huh. like i heard this like npr mm -hmm. <laughs> segment and i was like oh that way they like never quite taste like blueberries from a lower 48 we just all thought it was like our alaskan pride like these taste so much better than the lower 48 <laughs> But they're super tangy and tart, and um, I couldn't get them to taste like Alaskan blueberries or, you know, bilberries, whatever you want to call them, in the tea because the key to the flavor is its peel. And it's uh -huh. so juicy on the inside that when you dehydrate them or freeze dry them, they just don't rehydrate unless the water can penetrate and extract that peel. So we actually turn it into a blueberry hot chocolate where we have our own freeze dryer. We freeze dry the blueberries and we grind them into a powder. So now you're eating the blueberries in our dark chocolate blueberry hot cocoa. Um, and then uh, the, the fireweed and the little bush cranberries we can dry. And we use that for our Arctic Bliss which is a white tea blend. So that's got silver needles, white tea. It's not 100% Alaskan. Um, mm -hmm. It's got silver needles, white tea from China. And it won our first international award, which was third place at the North American tea championships years and years ago. Wow. Um, and, and all of these, the teas, the reason why I couldn't use the blueberries was because high quality teas are meant to be reinfused multiple times. Even this Arctic Bliss, you can re-steep up to four times. Like that's like a championship grade tea. Well, the blueberries not, maybe it might taste like blueberry the first time, but I couldn't keep, get it to change the way that extracted and infused for multiple steepings. And I was like, well, there's no point because this is a very expensive thing to forge and harvest. I mean, it's very competitive. Blueberries is like our gold here. Like we're not out there, you know, gold mining necessarily, but like everyone's got their secret spot of their blueberries. And like, we even start checking for blueberries at the end of June and look for the green berries before they've turned blue or the flowers, just so we can be the first to pick the blueberries oh, and yeah. like get them all before they're gone. Um and then the peony flowers was more recently when people came to me and they're like, what do I do with all these? Can you take these petals? Because all I do is I throw them into the compost pile. The moose don't want them. I have thousands of peony flowers I can't sell. And, and the compost pile just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And I was like, well, as long as you didn't spray, you didn't use, you know, pesticides, fungicides, you know, things on it. And mm -hmm. it's just all like essentially untouched and just watered. Then... I can take that and turn it into like a tea blend, but it's actually not tea, right? Cause it's an herbal. Right. Right. Um, so that's, yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, and you probably know, I I'm also an acupuncturist and have the Chinese herbal background. And so I'm like, okay, peonies and a lot of different things, often the root, not necessarily the flower petals, but I'm kind of like, wow, these could be a little bit, and I know you probably can't say this, but a little bit medicinally kind of to sayings too. Oh yeah, well, everything on earth has some sort of medicinal benefit. Everything, like it has, you know, it's all essentially like chemistry. It's mm -hmm. all natural and has to do with the balance of how things are utilized together. So um, that's how I see plants and, and that's how I see earth is like, everything has some sort of a reason, some, mm -hmm. you know, maybe not discovered or understood yet, but everything has its place and it can be beneficial to a certain degree, you know, even things that are toxic, right? Like <laughs> to a certain degree that, you know, could be utilized. Um, but yeah, we have an acupuncturist that moved in next to us, or next to our business oh, wow. recently. So we've been getting more new customers who are super excited because they just never been to our store before because they just hear tea shop. But then the acupuncturist refers so many people to come to us anyways. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, okay, great. Um, well, but that's yeah, a, that's a great. That's a great joint venture there. <laughs> I I honestly, no joke. Like I loved back in the day when I first started my practice, I would make people tea 
based on, you know, fire, earth, water, you know, like what their sign was or what constitutionally they needed a boost on. And I'd always have like tea bags of, you know, set up of the each ones and would do it. And oh my gosh, like people loved it. But unfortunately, I couldn't have my own tea company on top of taking care of patients. So it became tough. So I'm sure this acupuncturist is like, Jenny, <laughs> you're amazing. <laughs> Let's let's team up. Oh my gosh, I would be. Hey, I have a question for you though. Butterfly <laughs> pea flowers and coloring to to the t- herbal to stains is I'm going to keep telling myself that that's what these things are. Coloring makes everything so much prettier. Hibiscus flower, that kind of stuff. How did you discover the dried butterfly pea pea flowers? Is that up there in Fairbanks? Oh, so I don't grow that. So we okay. we give that from from Thailand. Ah, and we okay. use flowers and so I knew it was something that was getting popular a few years ago Mm -hmm. but I didn't really want to use it unless it had some sort of benefit Mm -hmm. for it you know what I mean I I honestly don't use it personally okay because I feel like there's not much flavor in it at least for me or other people are just like wow I just love the flavor of it and I'm like really just don't taste it but you know everyone's palate's a little bit different um Sure. And it's really amazing because it's so good for your skin, mm. right? Like that, that pigment. So like, if you think about foods as like a rainbow, right? Every pigment has some sort of component that does something. So when I talk to people about like their diets and like how colorful is your diet, right? Yeah. Like when things that are orange, have a certain um, component nutrient in it, things that are red, things that are green, um, things that are blue or purple, right? Mm-hmm. Blueberries, um, purple tea, grapes, butterfly pea flower mm-hmm. has a component that helps promote skin health. And you're like, oh, interesting. You know, there's there's different degrees of it depending on like the density of the pigments in there too, right? So Butterfly pea flower is one that's really fun to use. Um, We actually use it in our, so we make creamed honeys also. We sell honey, hot chocolate, and tea. So I guess tea is our first, you know, bread and butter. Then, (laughs) then, um, Then honey, and then the hot chocolate thing came about later because of the whole issue with the blueberries. I didn't know what to make. And we already made our own hot cocoa mix because- we bake. So I'm like, one day I ran out of Swiss Miss and I was like, oh, well, you can just make hot cocoa powder, like with cocoa powder. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, anyways, so recently the last couple of years, we started making different creamed honeys and creamed honey does not mean there's dairy in it. Creamed honey has to do with the creamy texture of changing the way the crystal structure, um, happens in the crystallization of raw honey. And Mm -hmm. we're in Alaska. So our honey our local honey here crystallizes as soon as it hits below 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And so all these people get rock hard honey, like all winter long, their honey is rock hard. So we started making it into creamed honey, which is changing the way the crystals, almost like tempering it, like making chocolate Mm -hmm. and um, having the crystals become very small, like a chain reaction, kind of like a snowflake. I think you can relate to snow. And so when the crystals start to develop, almost like how a snowflake becomes, like, or how ice structure becomes, when it's in a random formation, that's what makes raw honey rock hard and solid. So when you make creamed honey, you're you're seeding in a mutated crystal structure that can naturally occur, actually, in, in batches of honey. And you encourage it, so when it starts to crystallize, to build onto that chain reaction to be smooth, spreadable, creamy, and soft always, unless it's frozen. So (laughs) as soon as it warms up to room temperature, it's not frozen, but it's soft and creamy. And so that's why it's called creamed honey. So if you imagine carbon makes a diamond that's rock hard, diamonds, or I mean carbon in the lattice structure of a graphite pencil is smooth and slides. So all we're doing is encouraging the crystallization to be in that smooth sliding formation. And going back to butterfly pea flower, because of the color, right? It's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. We make different tea themed creamed honeys. We have a matcha creamed honey. We have an Earl Grey creamed honey. We have a lavender creamed honey. 
well, lavender flowers. So we use all whole ingredients in our creamed honey. So it's not flavoring agents. It's like actual ingredients. Mm -hmm. So when you take lavender flower powder and rehydrate it just a little bit, it is poo-poo brown. Not huh. attractive at all. But <laughs> butterfly pea flower is beautiful, right? It's that blue, bright, you know, thick, bold color. So what we do is we actually add butterfly pea flower powder to the creamed honey, but at a smaller density of that ingredient, if that makes sense. So now the gradient is thinner, so it doesn't turn out blue, it turns out purple. <laughs> wow. You are, you are like a little mad scientist over there with all this stuff. <laughs> this is so cool. I, I seriously, I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to get my butt up to Fairbanks. This is so fun. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. Cause you know, you're taking like at all, all the geeky aspects, of course, of all this that I absolutely, absolutely love. And, and cream, I never knew really what creamed honey was until, I mean, you just give it like the most perfect example. Wow. So, so dang cool. So I, I want to promote, you know, where you're at, things of that nature, because I think at this stage of the game, because I have so many folks listening to me from the the Pacific Northwest, in particular, the Seattle Tacoma area, it's not that far for them to get up to you at all. So now you said that you are in, um, obviously you're in Fairbanks, you're a little bit outside of town ish. Um, and you're, you're, are you not too far from the China hot springs too? Oh, no. Okay. So where my tea, my tea shop is, is actually near the airport, ah. which is the west side of town. And China Hot Springs is on the opposite. It's 60 <laughs> miles outside of the east side of town. Okay. So it's a one hour drive if it's like the summertime or like perfect road conditions. I'd say give people like an hour and a half one way. Um, the geothermal tea farm is not part of the geothermal tour of, of China Hot Springs Resort. That's where it is. It's in mm -hmm. partnership with China Hot Springs Resort. So my mm -hmm. husband and I know the owner. And during COVID, my husband challenged me. I see this <laughs> thing with my sister challenging me, like, drink that, try that, whatever. You know, and then I go, okay. So he challenged me to ask the owner who is our you know mutual friend if um i could grow my tea plants up there because it was the only place that i could think of that was 100 percent sustainable mm -hmm. because of the amount of energy that would it would cost energy whether it was fossil fuels whether it was coal whether you know what whatever, whatever was going to be like the the energy to heat and even cause the electricity and china hot springs resort is the first geothermal um power plant. They have their first, Alaska's first geothermal power plant cool. is at China Hot Springs Resort. And it's run off of the, the geothermal energy of the hot springs there. So all the electricity is off of the the geo, the hot springs, essentially, energy off the hot springs. Wow. Um, all the electricity, um, all the heat, there's pipes under um, the greenhouse where my tea plants are that keep the soil warm enough. Like it doesn't freeze, freeze. Because these are trees. The roots have to go into the ground. And then, um, and even the water, it's all like hot springs water. So like watering, when people go, what's the temperature of the water when it comes out when you're watering the tea plants? I'm like, well, warm. I mean, they're not hot. <laughs> it's like warm. <laughs> and um, and so everything I knew was like 100% sustainable there at that one location. And yeah. I didn't want it to be something that cost a lot of money or caused a lot of pollution to be yeah. able to have a project that was year round like that. That's so cool. And of course, I mean, there is the sunlight issue that happens as well. And, and power outages. I think I saw an Instagram or, or something or a YouTube video of you with power outage stuff going on. Of some oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because the snowstorm, like, so people didn't have, like, power here for, like, a week. Um, last winter, we called it Snowmageddon or Icemageddon because it, like, snowed, like, two feet, then it rained, and then it snowed another two feet, and then it rained, and then snowed another two feet. So it was, like, six feet of snow, but in between were layers of pure ice. And it was crazy. And so, but I live in a, also... 
I'm, I'm very much into sustainability as much as possible. I'm not perfect, but I try very hard. So I live in a SIPS house, means structurally insulated panels house. And my house is super efficient. We run off of less than 200 gallons of heating fuel a year. Wow. And so like I can take a space heater and warm up my whole house. Like all my light bulbs have to be LED. Otherwise the inside of my house heats up. So, um, so when that power outage happened, we actually like ran a power cord out the front door, like under the door and then plugged it into the generator. <laughs> like, and we were very fortunate that we could run off of everything off of like a little generator. Um, but yeah, it's power outages happen here in town. Power outages do happen at Sheena Hot Springs Resort. But I mean, they have 90 employees who live on the grounds there wow. that have like staff housing and they feed all their staff through all of the produce that they create in the greenhouse too. Oh, wow. And so, um, and that's how, so the produce that they use at their restaurant is there. They go through, um, I think it's 75 hundred pounds of tomatoes a day i could be wrong maybe 750 pounds of tomatoes a day are harvested in the summertime there um and yeah but i mean they do have power outages sometimes but then it's not too bad like it comes back on (laughs) but we do have lack of sunlight in the winter time which is one of the things that i learned the hard way this past winter some of the tea plants didn't make it through the dormancy period because i was like well there's enough sunlight it was not enough of like the right rays so i think like two of our trees didn't make it this winter when we didn't have grow lights on them for like a month (laughs) so yeah, I figured there had to be some sort of grow lights for at some point because having having been up to Fairbanks in various times of the year, I've noticed like, hmm, um, don't know how things would grow, you know, 100% things that I think about. I'm a, I'm a nerd. Um, so it does make sense that you would have to have some grow lights, but that's cool that it's it's all being powered by the geothermal energy, though, to be able to have. Yeah. It. Yeah, that's so cool. So cool. Gosh, Jenny, you have such a cool operation going on i can't wait to try out your teas i can't wait to share stuff with folks let's tell folks your instagram how they find you on instagram how they find you on your website give us all the scoop yeah so pretty much every social media handle including youtube you can use at sipping streams so we do even have a youtube channel which is youtube.com slash at sipping streams instagrams at sipping streams twitter it's at sipping streams the only platform i don't use is snapchat and tiktok so i don't use those um and then our website is really easy to find it's um sipping streams.com there you can find all sorts of links for all those other social media platforms um rt education that we have going on year round and and all of our products awesome Awesome. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. I can't wait to try out some tea, like I said. And then at the end of this podcast, I'll give a whole uh, review as to what I thought and all that. Thanks again for coming on, Jenny. Thanks for having me. Hey, Hell Junkies, are you feeling just off, feeling like you're aging a little bit faster than you want to and wondering what in the world is up? Hey, I might have some answers for you and some direction. If you want to chat with me, I am offering complimentary calls right now. You can head over to Dr. Spelled Out, J-K-R-A-U-S-E-N-D.com. Take my quiz, click on the schedule of chat, and let's talk and see if we can get you in the right direction. And if I'm able to help you, I'm going to let you know. Otherwise, I'm going to help you find what you're looking for. Head over to drjkrausnd.com. Hey, fellow health junkie. Thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoy tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.